Thanks. Um, I guess, well, I wanted to, I know, Ken, that you had stuff to say, sort of, you know, riffing off the, the Turkmenistan story, and I think you wanted to talk a little bit about the response from your, you know, fellow journalists. I can talk a little bit about the media response. Also, I should say that um, my email address is ken at harpers.org, and I'm always sort of interested in tips or ideas, and periodically um, also research intern help as well. So I want to make sure to also throw that out. Well, I mean, the, the media reaction to the piece was pretty interesting. I mean, Howard Kurtz, as I mentioned at the Post, <coughs> did a lengthy piece, big picture of me and everything, um, talking about how horrible it was what I had done and how, as it, you know, as I said, you can never use deception and that undercover reporting is always wrong. And, you know, even as he deceived me about why he was calling me and how he was still had a different mind about everything. Um, but, you know, the, the lobbying firms, and especially ABCO, aggressively courted the media and tried to turn, with some success, thanks to Kurt, um, into turning the story, it, it into a story about media ethics and not about, gee, should this lobbying firm be working for a Stalinist dictatorship. I mean, they wanted to change the subject. And they did have some success doing that. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, debate about the piece, and some media critics and outlets sided with me about it, and others took sort of the curse position. But, you know, as I, I just didn't really never, I, I knew that the piece would be criticized. I mean, in fact, I predicted to my editors before we wrote the piece, that we would be trashed by Howard Kurtz. And it's like, I knew that was like, okay, we're, I mean, that was obvious because he's sort of, you know, self appointed guru of media ethics and all things media in Washington. Um, I mean, to me, Kurtz is the weather vane on the conventional wisdom. I mean, I hate that sort of journalism. It's like, you know, there's no such thing as good or bad. Truth lies in the middle. Well, sometimes that's not true. I mean, sometimes there, there is right and wrong in the world. Um, but, you know, Kurtz's view is always that you have to have balance. This is this word that is destroying American journalism. <coughs> because, you know, when I worked at... <coughs> I worked at the LA Times. I'll try to keep this very quick. Um, but to me, this is, and I actually ended up writing about this and getting in... Well, I wouldn't say I got in any real trouble about it, but we're still at the LA Times. And um, I sent a memo to... Michael Massing of the New York Review about books about what had happened. I proposed a piece um, in 2006, I think it was, or 2000, no, 2004, to go to St. Louis before the elections. Because if some of you may remember, in 2000, of course, the real action, or the decisive action was in Florida in terms of the presidential election, but St. Louis was a disaster. I mean, they, they were, you know, huge numbers of African American voters in the city were prevented from voting. I mean, there's just lines all over. I mean, when John Ashcroft's Justice Department says there's been a violation of civil rights against African Americans, you know it's bad. <laughs> so the city of St. Louis entered into a consent decree with the federal government to make sure that African Americans were not prevented from voting in 2004. So I pitched a piece to my editors and said, hey, I'm here, I contact, I contact the people. There are a lot of problems in St. Louis. And the Secretary of State in Missouri is a very right-wing Republican who happens to be on the bush Cheney re-election committee. And, you know, let's take a look at the situation. This is a, you know, this could be a very serious matter. And so <coughs> they agreed to send me to St. Louis to do a piece on this. And I actually think I turned in a pretty good story. Um, where I did talk to both sides, but I said, hey, there are a lot of worrisome signs here. And, you know, Republicans are saying, oh, it's, you know, the Democrats are going to cheat. And there are all sorts, you know, that, that, that there are all these people fraudulently registering to vote with phony names like, you know, Willie Mays or Tiger Woods or whatever. You know, people are registering under phony names. Like, okay, first off, you know that there's not going to be enough fraud in that case. Actually, this was an Acorn story. They said that Acorn was registering all these people under phony names. Um, this was a bogus story, a bogus Republican story that was 
reported throughout the 2004 campaign that you know Acorn and other groups were registering all these people fraudulently. There was that you were never going to. Okay, so let's say you register as Tiger Woods. What happens? You're going to actually go to vote and have an ID, and they're going to let you vote. I mean, this was not going to impact the election. And I even had the head of the, the Republican head of the elections in St. Louis say it's sort of ridiculous. I mean, there's not we're not seeing any cheating on the Democratic side. So I turn in a story about the potential problems in St. Louis in this critical swing state of Missouri, <clears throat> which turned out, I do have to admit, you know, Missouri went Republican by five or six percent, so it wasn't as close as, as, as it looked like it might be one point. But I turn in this story, and, you know, I don't hear from my editor, which is always a bad sign, and then I'm told the next day that they've decided that we should do the piece from four states, from Missouri, but also from Florida and Wisconsin, and I can't remember the fourth state. Um, so it was like two states where Republicans say there's going to be problems, and two states where Democrats say there's going to be problems. And so you end up with this idiotic story that says the Republicans say Democrats are cheating, and the Democrats say Republicans are cheating. So first off, who's going to read the story? I mean, you read the headline, and you already know what you're going to read. And secondly, you're just saying, oh, you know, we, we're unable as reporters to evaluate what we see. We can't, we can report, but we can't use our brains and pass judgment. You know, this was a case where in Missouri, it was clear that the problems were all on one side, but they decided we had to balance this out with four states, you know, so that it looked like we weren't taking sides. Um, and I actually, you know, I wrote a, a memo to my editor saying, you know, this is great. We've sent, you know, spent, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars and sent reporters to four different states to produce a story that says absolutely zero. I mean, what a waste of time and money. Um, so, you know, to me, I'm just digressing here, but, you know, the current view of media is just that one should never have a point of view, you know, and to me it's, re it's just sort of reflective of the general collapse of Washington journalism and the way that so many Washington reporters are so close to the people they're supposed to be covering that they're incapable of doing it in any honest, decent way. I mean, you know, you have reporters who, you know, they can make the same amount of money um, as the lobbyists and politicians they cover. Their kids go to the same <coughs> private schools. They vacation together in Martha's Vineyard. They spend time at the same bars. They're friends. And, you know, so it's very embarrassing to, to write something that might embarrass you at your next cocktail party. And that's a big problem with Washington journalism in general, in my view. And I think this is a self-serving interpretation, but I think part of the reaction to my piece was, how dare you? you know? And so there was, a, there was a lot of criticism of the piece from the mainstream. There's a kind of small example. Oh, sorry. Um, from our film of um, an example of a journalist just completely ignoring the story and writing the story that she wanted to write regardless of what she was seeing in front of her. And it's pretty dramatic and, and just, it maybe is the most interesting bit of investigative journalism in the film, although it's not highlighted as that. But it, it's, um, we're impersonating the head of um, the Department of, HUD of uh, Housing and Urban Development in New Orleans a year after Katrina. And on the dais with me is uh, Mayor Nagan of New Orleans and Governor Blanco of Louisiana. And afterwards, it's revealed to be a hoax. The media immediately figures it out. There's no, no question. Um, I know it's all these fantastic things, and the reporter gets it, gets me. And, um, and then another reporter starts interviewing me and says, pretends to believe that I actually am the deputy secretary uh, of HUD and follows me around and we go to um, a mock ribbon cutting ceremony at public housing, which I've announced on the podium we're not going to destroy after all. HUD actually was going to destroy the public housing I announced we're not going to destroy it. And her story, um, she's decided right at the beginning is going to be, oh my god, they gave false hopes to the victims. This is really cruel. The people who were hoping to get back into their public housing are not going to be able to. And we go there, and she's interviewing me. And it, you know, in, in the in the process of the interview, she calls me out and says, "Actually, you're not," and so on. But um, 
one thing in the film, you see uh, a resident of public housing, you see her asking a resident of public housing, what do you think of this hoax? This is not true, they've just concocted it. You're not getting into this public housing. And she says, and the resident says, um, quite clearly, I think it's fantastic, it's a hoax, um, so what? It's called people out here to see what we're going through, and that's what's important, so I don't care if it's a hoax. And she doesn't use that in the broadcast. <coughs> so the, ho the broadcast is still about that party line, which is, you know, we created this false thing, it's of course it's the right thing to do to destroy it. You know, it doesn't call into question anything about what we had hoped to call into question. If I can just real quickly say that the public reaction to my piece was overwhelmingly favorable. I mean, usually when I write a piece, I do get a fair, you know, you always have people 20%, 30%, mostly they're on your side, of course, if they're readers of Harper's, but I get lots of critical emails. And on this, in this case, it was overwhelmingly favorable, and I got the best email. Unlike the general reaction in, amongst the Washington media, the public was, just, you know, very enthusiastic. The best email I ever got in my life, I think, certainly ranking high, was, from a woman who said to me, um, I love your story, and if you die tomorrow, you should be happy. I'm like, you've done it. I was like, thank you. That, I felt good for a whole week. <laughs> so, I mean, there was no, you know, the general public didn't have this angst about, gee, what's worth, you know, deceit, going undercover into a lobbying for her dream to represent a Stalinist dictatorship. <laughs> this, is, this is a big moral dilemma for Howard Kurtz, but, you know, the, you know, your neighbor does not think like that. So. Cool. I, yeah, I, I wanted to open it up now to questions since there's a lot of people and I want to leave a lot of time for that. So I don't know if there's a mic floating around out there anywhere. If there's not, I guess we're just going to ask, that, ask people to be really loud so we can hear well. This is a big room. Um, I'm going to start with this guy because I saw his, his hand first. Hi. Um, question for Andy. What did you hear about the The basic, the basic uh, the, it, there's basically three steps. You think of a funny story, or you think of an issue, you think of a target, what you want to talk about. You think of a funny story, a way to get that into the media in a funny way. Um, because if you want to get a story into the media about something important, um, there's pretty much only two ways to do it. Either it's a very serious, situation where people are dying right now and there's something incredibly important and it could affect national security or something on that order, um, or it's hilarious. And journalists can write about things that are funny or incredibly serious. So you create a very funny situation around a very serious issue and then you do it. You do whatever you have to do um, and then you publicize it. That's basically it. You publicize it, you send out a press release to thousands and thousands of journalists or if you have the time and the footage, you create a video news release that they can just pop right on TV, just like uh, um, they do with corporate video news releases. So it's no different from what corporations do all the time. The public relations industry sends out thousands and thousands of press releases, which is probably one of the reasons uh, a lot of the media has gotten so lazy, um, and just reprints it, and understaffing is, of course, Yeah, I had not even heard this until we were having a conference call, I think, yesterday. I had not heard that they had so heavily edited the, the footage. That completely changed everything, as I was saying earlier. And, you know, I don't, I mean, in, in that case, I think that the, the issue lies with the journalists and how they produce it. I mean, it's, you know, they must, I am presuming, they did a very good job of editing it. I mean, I know that. The Daily Show and Colbert initially did extremely sympathetic treatments of the acorn. 
stain. Um, and you know, these are not, they're not typically taking the side of, you know, conservative. I mean, they wouldn't normally have taken that position. I'm sure, I, I mean, I saw, I thought, wow, that's amazing. That's ridiculous that, I mean, I, I, was, I was offended by what they appeared to have shown, and which now appears to be in grave doubt, which was, you know, they claim pimp and prostitute go in and they're looking for a place and they're suggesting that they're gonna be bringing in underage prostitutes from Central America. Hey, I'm sorry, that's an outrage. I don't care whether it's a left-wing group or a right-wing group who's doing it. So I, I, I don't know, I mean, I have to say, I thought it was legit. It was reported as a legitimate story. So I think that, you know, if, if the journalists are committing fraud, that's hard to, it's hard to know. It's now come out, and I think that will obviously change the, the yeah. narrative about this. I mean, I'll just add up two, two seconds. I mean, Media That Matters, which is a big organization that monitors a lot of, um, you know, sort of stories and how they're treated in the media. I mean, they've really done a whole sort of unpackaging of it, and I think that even now, even though, you know, Colbert and, and a lot of pretty big sort of shows and, and, and websites have said, look, we need to talk about this in a different way, this whole new, you know, totally manipulation of the editing, um, has changed the story, but A, the damage has already been done. I mean, Acorn sort of, I mean, you know, that's kind of over. They've lost their funding. That's probably not going to, you know, even private donations probably not going to come back. But the even major, you know, even the New York Times is still writing, um, you know, in that language that, you know, when blah, 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 went into the office, we're in a pimpsuit, blah, blah, blah. Um, so they're even, I think they're running a campaign to try to get the New York Times to stop framing it in that way because. It's just not true. It's not accurate. Mm -hmm. um, my, this, my dad's one of the he brought it for it. So I just wanted to um, ask him if he would be I don't No, I think though that given what, and again, what they, you know, it now appears that they faked what they achieved. I think it's very difficult for the mainstream media to resist, you know, it's, it's very easy to pressure the mainstream media into feeling like, oh, the mainstream media feels like it's always accused of being liberal, too liberal, and so they're complete pushovers to that whole line in general. And they go out of their way. I mean, I noticed that, I have to say, I liked working at the LA Times in, for the most part. I had some problems there, but, you know, I generally was able to do what I liked to do there, and I didn't have any, well, I did have some problems, but not many. Um, <clears throat> but there's a real fear, I think, of being labeled too liberal, and and partly it's, well, it's partly a fear of being labeled as too liberal, and partly the idea that the media is too liberal is entirely overblown. I mean, li you know, liberal is. I would say that most people who worked at the Washington office of the LA Times, where I have direct experience, were probably pro-choice and in favor of civil rights for gay, for gay people, and you know, these sort of very narrow social issues, and not narrow, but so on social issues, reporters tend to be liberal, there's no question about that, at least in Washington offices. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a major city. I mean, you find typically liberals in major cities, and reporters do tend to be liberal on those issues. But in general, I mean, on economic issues, not at all. I mean, trade is an issue that is impossible to cover. I mean, there's the old line that you know, American reporters will start covering trade properly when reporting jobs are outsourced to India. 
I mean, it's a very privileged profession. And for the most part, the media isn't liberal at all. I don't think, I have to say, I do not believe the media is conservative either. I think that's also misleading. The media is established. The media is uncritical. The media is not, however, I do not believe, the, other than Fox News, which is obviously right wing, but overall, the New York Times, when I hear liberals or lefties talk about the New York Times being a right wing or conservative publication, I think that's ridiculous. It's not. But it's, it's nothing, it's an establishment newspaper. It reflects, you know, it's, it reflects mainstream establishment opinion for the most part. So. I that question without giving a completely depressing reply, so I'm going to let Andy take over here. <laughs> no, same here. I, I, well, less depressing, maybe. Hopeful. Um, I mean, there's WikiLeaks, right? Um, does that accept video? I, I've never used it. What? They're planning on it? So I guess WikiLeaks with video would be what you're talking about, right? Where you, you can just upload stuff that you find. It's spooky, the potentials of it, but um, also maybe very powerful. Any, any thoughts on the electoral oh, ramifications? Oh, and the electoral ramifications of it. Uh, I guess just, you know, uh, no. <laughs> I'm sure there are, but, you know, I mean, I mean my I two, thinking about it. I mean, my two cents would be sort of in a larger, you know, sense of, the word that Ken does and the yes man and other sort of, you know, journalists that are making very big, powerful institutions that most of us don't think we can ever even get close to influencing seem more vulnerable, maybe, and seem maybe like, you know, they're, they're made up of people, too, and we can change them, and we can try to change them, and we can make them seem, you know, a little more on the defense, and I think that can be part of the electoral project, too, as an empowering thing and getting people feeling like, you know, it's hope is not lost, these big, you know, powerful institutions can be changed. Yeah. I mean, I think there are, yeah, just to continue on that optimistic note, I think there are things that change history and that make things more democratic. And investigative reporting is obviously one of them. Civil disobedience is obviously kind of the, one of the only things that's really improved things in the United States. Um, you know, with uh, the uh, New Deal um, under Roosevelt and, Roosevelt's hand being pushed by massive de unrest, really, not not just his own decision to do the right thing. Um, apartheid, um, segregation, et cetera, et cetera. All, pretty much any major improvement in American history, I think, you can look at it and say that came about because of civil disobedience, um, one way or another, I think. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of historians in the room. Thank you. 
things, I don't really have a reply to it. I mean, I, I mean, self-evidently true. The Electoral College, you know, if one looks at the historical reasons behind the Electoral College, it was to precisely to make sure that people, the average, quote, average person didn't have too much power. I mean, the whole point of the Senate as the upper, upper chamber um, was to make sure that the House didn't get too radical. I mean, we don't, that's not, doesn't seem to be a big problem these days. But, I mean, obviously these are enormous issues. And, you know, I wouldn't know how to begin to address them here other than to say, I, you know, I agree with you. It's very, very difficult in this country I mean, the other question about what are the electoral ramifications, it's frustrating because the two parties have rigged the system in such a way that politically it's extraordinarily difficult to form a third party. I mean, you know, just the 5% threshold is an enormous deterrent. You know, you can't get matching funds unless you get 5% of the vote. And then, you're, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, debate, can, whatever it's called, I forget it. The, you know, the, the presidential debates, you can't get on those unless you've got a certain percentage in the polls. I mean, the whole system has been set up by both the parties to make sure that there's no third party challenger. Both, and both parties are completely complicit in it. And so it, it, it is it's difficult to imagine, I'm sorry to say, how to break out of it, but your points are all. This is, if this is a time when, the, to, to attack this issue, if this is a time to address it, um, and you're interested in that, then I think the, the thing to do would be to find a, a large, an organization that's doing that, that's interested as well. And if you were interested in like using some hard techniques to, to do that, then you would just try to find a funny story that really clarifies how seen it is. Because you can talk math, and people will listen to the math and understand it, but they might just not get as outraged as they should. But you could come up with a funny story that would just clarify the line and make it brutally funny what it means and how it can be changed. But you know, work with an organization that has a strategy for changing that or stopping whatever needs to stop. Maybe somebody on this side of the room. Um, and so that that's kind of a, a 
an indicator of the limits of, of this kind of activism in itself, by itself. Of course, it wasn't by itself. It was in conjunction with a fight that's been going on for 25 years in Bhopal, a lot of uh, people fighting very coherently, very strategically to make this a precedent, make, to, to force Dow to do something in Bhopal and set a global precedent. We contributed a little bit to it. Um, it's also why we made a movie, uh, because people don't remember media blips. There's so many of them. Um, so who knows what its effect on people was, um, but it wasn't enormous. Uh, I, if I can, this is another sort of discouraging story. I did a piece when I was at the LA Times about <clears throat> Sao Tome, which is another small African nation with lots and lots of oil, and as an, a, a company in Houston, that was it was just a total sham. It was two employees, uh, no assets. I mean, they had like six dollars in the bank. Somehow, it managed to buy up a significant stake in the oil fields of Sao Tome, and it was clear that they had paid off government officials in Sao Tome. There was some money had changed hands, very, very obviously. <coughs> And so I did what I thought was a great piece exposing, you know, like they had given the children of government officials in South Tome got scholarships to attend American universities. There was all sorts of money that, that changed hands. Some of it maybe legally and some of it probably not. So I did a story in the, on, in the LA Times, it was on the front page, it was 2,500 words, which is big by newspaper standards. I was very pleased with myself. Um, and the next day, the shares of this company stock tripled uh, because the impact had been that people were like, oh wow, this company is really undervalued. So now we can buy up shares cheap and make a fortune. I would have this a great idea that I was going to expose corruption and fraud and I made a fortune for this slime balls who owned the company. And then I started getting phone calls from investment advisors asking me for advice on how they could get into Sao Tome. It was really very depressing. I mean, I was really pleased with myself for about 12 hours. <laughs> it all fell apart. So the law of un unintended consequences yeah. um, strikes again. There was, I know this woman way back there had a question. So we, we stopped um, thinking that we would have an effect on the conference goers. Um, but this is what we kind of have our hope in, partly, um, that you sit people in front of a movie for an hour and a half and they actually remember it. Like, I've forgotten almost every media event since 1980, but I remember a few movies, um, especially the political ones. And, you know, Michael Moore's uh, Friend had 9 11, it didn't beat George Bush, but it did cost Bush a lot of votes. And a lot of people changed their votes because of that movie. So, there, and there's a lot of other examples of films having effects, I think more than media blips. Um, the other answer for us is this Yes Lab thing, where we're, we're trying to spread this as a means of just getting uh, important issues into the media and uh, help that to happen. So it happens more. 
I would just say real quickly, as cynical as I am, which is probably pretty <coughs> obvious by now, I don't think the work is a waste. I mean, as I said, I don't expect to change the world, but often you do things and you have no idea of the impact you're having until years later. I mean, I've worked on stories where there was, you know, I thought, oh my God, there's, you know, this is going to be a big stink and nothing happens. It's really disappointing. And then years later, you realize, oh, somebody, another journalist saw it and did a story that they had a bigger impact. You know, you just, I mean, I, I've had great successes in terms of having impact with some stories. <coughs> I did a piece for the LA Times that led to the FBI raiding the offices of Congressman Weldon and his daughter, who ran a lobbying firm that did nothing but, you know, re I mean, the, all the clients were, companies that the congressman had done favors for. And, you know, the congressman lost, it was right before the election, he lost the election, his life was destroyed, I'm very happy to say. Actually, that's not really true, but it did, you know, cause him severe embarrassment and discomfort. It led to him getting kicked out of Congress. You don't always get that. I mean, you rarely get that. But often your impact, your work has an impact. The Michael Moore thing, I know, okay, it didn't change the election, I took, 18 year old kid to see that movie who had enrolled in the Marines. And I said, you know, when you enroll in the, in the Army, you have 30 days to get out. After those 30 days, it's all over. I mean, then you're really, it's very, very difficult to get out. I took someone to see Fahrenheit 9 11, um, and they got out. They went up, they had signed up in Baltimore, and they got out. They went back to Baltimore and got out. I mean, okay. You know, if he did nothing else with that movie, that's one great thing. So I say take your victories big and small. Uh, this gentleman right here with the green shirt. Okay. Um, I just really appreciate uh, hearing the comments from both of you about, um, I like what you're saying about the, the standing and the ESN model and the stock and the first use of uh, direct action techniques. I don't know if others have seen have one tiny little note just because it's kind of an anecdote but it was a very inspiring anecdote for me I was in uh, DC yesterday there was a kind of a big student-led anti-war um, action because um, today <coughs> is the seventh anniversary of the Iraq invasion and um, these kids had they you know they're 18 19 20 and they had taken they basically borrowed Lady Gaga's images put them on all of their anti-war you know literature and their branding if you will and the way they framed the whole thing was, look, this is a bad romance. So, you know, this is an older crowd, so maybe not everybody knows. That's like the number one pop song that's been on the charts for weeks and weeks and weeks now. But they said, you know, their whole pitch was like, look, we're having a bad romance with this administration. We loved you, Obama. We worked for you. We helped get you in office. Um, now you're cheating on us. You're sending us off to war, et cetera. So, I mean, I just, I, I think that's like kind of a, you know, it's a different version, but it's, it's, you know, they even said, look, you know, we would love Lady Gaga to sue us because then we would get a shitload of press, you know, PR for this. <laughs> so I just, I cite that as what I think and struck me as a very creative and, and kind of inspiring example. Yeah. Yeah, these guys. yeah no, I mean, we, we hope that with this institute or whatever to look at all the different kinds of ways that people have gotten, get attention for things and Billboard Liberation is amazing and fantastic way to do that, even just graffiti sometimes. Uh, we've gotten into civil disobedience. We tried to launch a civil disobedience uh, draft, basically, uh, against the war. So you would sign up, basically, allowing yourself to be, uh, saying, I'm willing to be drafted to be arrested, um, if necessary. And uh, it's it worked a little bit, but could work better. But um, what I'm trying to say is that 
like civil disobedience is probably the most powerful um, media <coughs> and um, media technique and also just technique for letting people know and pushing power um, are one of them anyways. So yeah, we would definitely want to encourage all of that. It's Young woman with the black jacket? Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll be showing a bit more of that um, this evening at the 8 p.m. comedy show, um, as if we were comics. But yeah, the Chamber of Commerce is suing us, and um, it's so far it's a laugh riot. It's um, there's been a, so there was a lawsuit. You can you can see it all on eff.org, Electronic Frontier Foundation.org. Um, can find it there, all the documents. So there's the, the case, there's the uh, motion to dismiss of our lawyers, there's the chamber's um, opposition to the motion to dismiss, and then there's our yeah, lawyers' so opposition to their opposition. And the last, the last document on there is hilarious. It's really like it's hilarious reading. It's not like reading a legal document. The 30 second backstory for why the US Chamber of Commerce is suing oh, the yes, Med, yeah. plus Jane Doe 1 through 20. Um, is because uh, in, in late October, the Yes Men and um, some great student activists in DC um, borrowed a room at the National Press Conference, borrowed the logo of the US Chamber of Commerce, and, and gave a big speech to the media, uh, many of whom showed up, and, and, and reported briefly that the US Chamber of Commerce had made a very uncharacteristic um, and pretty uh, surprising policy shift. They were no longer gonna um, reject you know any any uh, legislation to, to bring down emissions. They were gonna they were gonna you know they're now gonna fight for stronger legislation on carbon emissions. Um, and you know this crowd probably already knows the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has been one of the biggest lobbyists against any sort of regulation of carbon emissions and climate change <coughs> stuff. Um, so this came as a big surprise to the media. And actually, I had a question for Ken that I think you know I want to hear what he thinks because this this ruse involves briefly lying to a lot of the, the you know, the Washington media. And, and the Reuters reported it, the Times reported it, Fox Business News reported it briefly before somebody slipped the guy a piece of paper and, and um, you know, he was live and he said, oh, never mind. Um, so, but I, I'm interested to hear from Ken about what he thinks of the Yes Men sort of using, you know, lying to journalists to, to get attention for a cause. Well, it never, bothered me. I mean, I guess it might have bothered me if I reported it, um, I suppose. But I just thought it was a really wonderfully funny use of the media. And I confess I didn't really think about it in terms of the ethics of it. I mean, it's sort of like aura. I mean, you're pulling off something that is funny and farcical. There was, I mean, Okay, so it's a little bit embarrassing maybe to the Reuters guy who put this story out, but presumably they can do, in a way you sort of expose just how easy it is to put out a press release and get, you know, well, you're, I mean, journalism is supposed to be about a little bit more than just recording off of a press release. So, you know, personally, I probably would have been upset if I had reported the story, but, um, you know, I don't know. It's just a really funny prank. It was cool. I loved it, so, I mean, I didn't, have any problem with it. The Chamber of Commerce did not, they filed suit, and that's what I'm going to take one more question, and then we, have, we do have to get out of here for the next panel. Um, <coughs> this guy, way all the way in the back, he's been waving. Be very loud. You mentioned Michael Moore. I just want to tell you, I was the person that did the analysis of the, uh, the uh, videotape that uh, was broadcast by Fox that has now led to the A1 above the fold story today in the New York Times that ACORN is finished. The membership of 500,000 working class people was destroyed by amateur. Michael Moore was on Larry King Live that night. Larry King Live presented him with that bogus videotape and Michael Moore said, I never use hidden camera. And he said nothing to support ACORN. Nothing. Turned his back on ACORN. We now know it led to a bill in Congress defunding ACORN that Obama signed 
that Acorn sued and won the federal lawsuit as a bill of attainment. No one came to the aid of Acorn. Not Michael Moore, not Spike Lee. Anyone in this room come to the aid of Acorn? Um, quick rejoinder, the Yes Men wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post Outlook section that said, geez, if this guy you know, dressed up as a pimp can get Congress to act and defund our organization, look, we've done all this stuff. We've got a lot of people saying atrocious things on camera. How come Congress didn't act against them? Um, you know, I mean, I don't, that's a big question. I don't know who else. Is <laughs> but I think on that note, we do have to end because there's another panel following. Um, Whitney has a sign-up sheet for all of those who want to become yes people, maybe, in the future. Um, you can sign up with, with her. And then um, Andy has DVDs, and we're going to be hanging out with our buddies in AK Press for a little while afterwards. If you want to meet Andy, you can buy a DVD. Talk to him being on Yes Men. That's in the book there back in the... Um, oh, and Mike, it looks like Mike finally made his bus. Hi there. Play, play both. Hi. Will you be Uh No, I'm not. Just this one. Are you typing in next one? No, I was asking so I'm not thinking of accomplish I don't know where we're at. I'm just volunteering. I don't know how the whole thing's gonna work. There's a guy named Matt apparently at the uh wanna know if you the next